Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, this is Matt Chat, uh, episode 378. Uh, this is the fourth and final installment of my interview with the great Tim Lang. In this part of the interview, we uh, focus in more on the collapse and the behind-the-scenes stuff going on at uh, New World Computing. Very sad, touching stuff, actually. I know you will, uh, I don't know if enjoy is quite the right word, but you'll definitely want to hear that part. Uh, we also talk about some basic uh, game design principles, what makes a game fun, the sort of thing Tim looks for when he's hiring designers. And uh, we wrap up with uh, some thoughts about uh, Might and Magic 10 Legacy, or as uh, Tim calls it, Might and Magic uh, The Legend of Grimrock. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Tim Lang. So, but these days, I don't even know if if, uh, if Lift Tech is still around anymore. I haven't heard of a game not being done in, in Unreal or, or Unity or Gamebryo in who knows how long. Well, so with the exception of the fly spell and the uh -huh. more, more polys or higher poly counts, I mean, was there, was there anything else that you really felt like should have been in there? Uh, you just couldn't get in. I mean, what were you? What was in, your, it, there was there was a ton, there. there was a ton, ton. I wish. I mean, I I wish we we could have done so many. Th I can't even name all of them. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of what I I wished for that was within reason ended up in in the the Telp one point three patch, mm -hmm. which I was glad to see that when Might Magic Nine came on Good Old Games, that was the patch that they used. Uh, but one thing that that I really, really wanted to do at the time, that you can see a little bit of, but but we never we never got got there the way I wanted to was was the the breathing world scripted event stuff. So at the time I was playing a lot of Half Life, and Half Life, the original Half Life, was very scripted. You know, a lot of a lot of things happening around you while you're playing the game, and I wanted to bring that. To might and magic so that, that you know there's a guy who's who from uh you know eight to ten drinks at the bar and then he goes home and then he goes to work and and you know so there's some of that in there there's there's guards that do patrols and 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 uh i think they're actually in sturmford there's a guy who he's a drinks at the bar and then he goes home but but that's a that's a lot of individual scripting that we just didn't have time for and and it's too bad because I was really excited about that. And one other thing that I wanted to do, that I uh, an idea that I kind of wanted to steal from from uh, Lord British was the idea of of morality. Hmm. And and not to the extent that he did. What an interesting but... thing to to want to steal from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, like he always in in all the Ultima games, there's always kind of that subtext of of. Uh, the the consequences of your behavior, hmm. and I wanted to add some of that into to Might and Magic, where there were there would be multiple ways of solving a level, you know. So instead of just going in and, and slaughtering monsters and and stealing the treasure and leaving, you know, maybe instead you it was like you do like a thief sort of game where you could go in and beat everybody up, but you could also sneak in and not kill anybody and get a special bonus for that. Maybe. Maybe uh, uh, like it's a uh, for for the rogues. It's a trainer. One of the trainers says, "Get in there, don't kill anybody, and come back out." Yeah, you know, maybe maybe that's what you have to do for promotion, or you know, but but again, never never could do it. No, not enough time. And so I guess the what it really was is you just needed more time. <laughs> I you know it's that's it, that's, a... that's probably every every game developer in the world <laughs> you know beethoven famously said said uh, great works are never finished they're only abandoned nice. and and i think video games are basically the same thing you know you can work on them for forever and and then yeah, we're but seeing some of that right now going on with some of these uh, kickstarter projects right there. oh yeah yeah and i mean you saw Wasn't that that's supposed to come out three years ago <laughs> what's going there, there was ton that's that's been happening for yeah. forever though like you know the Duke Nukem Four. <laughs> that was one of those same sorts of same sorts of. of uh, well, there was I think there was a few more than just uh, uh, work on it for too long kind of issues with that one, but but uh, yeah, definitely the Kickstarter stuff and and things. You just there there comes to a point where you got to say this is good enough. Yeah, just get it done. And and that's even today. That's something I, I always struggle with with. 
with every all the games I'm, I, I've worked on. You say, well, okay, okay. You know what? That's a, that's a bug I can accept. <laughs> Particularly when it's when it's a, a, a nasty one to fix. I did a game actually that uh, uh, was called Squeeze Shapes, and this was it was a brat game. It was uh, four or five years ago. It, was for, it came out for the Android, and and it was published by a, a company called Tapjoy, and they were they were very they were great in terms of the, I think they had some great feedback that that made it a better game. But uh, when it came to the release date, they did a, a limited release where they're – and when I mean limited release, it's limited marketing push. Uh, in Canada, just as an initial, let's get some feedback on it. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of the feedback centered on the difficulty of the controls. And basically the idea of the game was that you were a, a – a, restorer of great paintings and you had to patch put these patches on the paintings to to restore them and the puzzle game part of it was that these patches were different shapes they were either a square circle or a triangle and you would have to like like pinch and pull those shapes to get them the right right shape to fit on the screen and the pinch and pull part was it never worked quite the way i wanted it to and and a lot of people uh, in in their reviews said yeah this you know this doesn't work too well and so they said uh, we want you to change that we want you to make it a lot better and I said well okay <laughs> um, you know they uh, there's no more money coming so you know this is going to be me basically doing it for free and I'd taken a job with a company called Small Lab Learning at the time so and that was doing uh, um, educational games using the Kinect camera. So a lot of my time was spent doing that rather than working on my game. Mm-hmm. And I spent, but I spent a lot of time working on revamping the mechanic of the game. And I got it to a point where it worked good, except uh, that I had to, I would have had to redo the level, the the level editor, and I would have would have had to rebuild every single level. And and I went back and I told him that, and I said this is this is going to be a lot of work. <laughs> it's going to be, you know, six months and and whatever. And and they said, well, you know, we're not going to do a a big push on this game unless you do that. Said, well, I guess, I guess we're done then. <laughs> so I kind of abandoned that game. And I mean, it's still out there. You can still download it. And it's still available on on uh, on the Android, but. But if you play it and go play it and, and see, like you'll see, oh yeah, that doesn't quite work right. That's got to be painful. It is. It is, and it's it's something that that I always wanted to go fix. But I was like, okay, so now I could spend all my time redoing that game, or I can move on and do cooler stuff, more fun stuff. So I chose to move on and do the more fun stuff. <laughs> I got another question here from Lars. I want to make sure to get him in here because he's the one to help me get in contact yeah. with him. Yeah. Uh, so he says, uh, you mentioned that the absence of JVC, uh, John Van Canningham, uh, was felt throughout mm. the last years of New World Computing. How did that mm. affect the morale of the team? Yeah, that's – that time and uh, there's always there's always this – I think there's a little subtext about people think that, that maybe there's some hostility between John and I. Um, which there isn't. Uh, it, it stemmed from uh, he had said some things after Might and Magic had come out. That basically, or Might and Magic Nine, Nine, yeah. Nine, said, um, I, I, you know, they were Might and Magic Nine had been reviewed very poorly, and and I think Heroes Four had as well. And he said, well, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with that, and and. The way it had sounded to me when I had read his comments was, was, you know, it was all the team's fault, and which which kind of upset me. I'm like, well, man, you know, we all worked really hard on this, and and uh, and you know, you, you kind of need to stand by and say, Threw you know what, the bus sounds like, you know, that's that, and that's that's how I think I well, it's definitely how I felt at the time, and and I don't know, I think other people did, and I said some things about that. Um, 
which you know he wasn't around at the time. He's and out so I kind racing of, his cars, I think. <laughs> and and it, it it sounded a lot like I think I was saying, well, you know, step up. And but but I, he didn't. We talked about it. John and I talked about it um, afterwards uh, via email, and I, I think he, I had misconstrued his comments a little bit like that because at the time morale at New World was was all very uncertain. You know, it was very low at the time between everybody. And I tried to be be as much a cheerleader as I could as the lead designer because that's kind of part of the job of designers, keeper of the vision. A lot of this had nothing to do with, with the team, right? It was just this 3DO. No, well, yeah, 3DO. Was external was, consider, external stuff. Was going through a, lot of, a lot of money issues at the time. And so we'd seen a lot of layoffs. And, and so everybody was very concerned for their jobs. And and I'm sure that that John probably felt very the same thing too, very much, very much the same, and and which was why he was kind of staying away. And, and well, honestly, you'd have to ask him why he was he was um, working working from home so much. And and because I really don't know if he was he was doing stuff, uh, were actually working on the games or not. I I really I really don't know. He I do know that that. We would get comments from him sometimes, and he'd ask for builds and, and things, and, and issue comments on them. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I do remember one story about about the layoffs that that was not good for morale. Which um, one of our designers came in. I was sitting in the office of our our director. One of the designers came in and said, "I read on Fat Babies that there's layoffs today." And Fat Babies was like a it was a little bit like video game or four chan. <laughs> It was kind of a seedy little underbelly for game developers and and stuff that that a lot of a lot of smack talking a lot of a lot of just bad stuff going on there and gossip and things and 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 I remember uh, the director saying everything's fine just you know go back to work and he and I both knew that everything was not fine uh, uh, an hour and a half later she was packing her desk oh, wow. And, and and that happened all the time, you know. Three D O say, okay, you got to cut X amount of people, and and so the morale was pretty bad. Um. So I yeah, it, but we did. I mean, we did our best. We did our best to get get the game out and and make it as good as it could be. <laughs> you know, considering. Uh, so, why didn't? Might Magic Nine have a subtitle? <laughs> Speaking Is that of John, something that got left off, you know. Uh, n- well, no, <laughs> no, it, it's a. So, I created a subtitle for Might and Magic Nine, and it was okay. called "The Writ of Fate." All right. And that sounds and, great uh, to me. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's like if you look on on Moby Games or a lot of places, will have it titled as. It's unofficial titles as Rid of Fate, and <clears throat> it had not. It was not the official title, but that's what I'd been calling it, and and that's what what uh, Keith had been calling it, and and when John got wind of it, he didn't like it. He wasn't a fan of it, and and uh, his rule was that that it was a little too sophisticated a title. I think too sophisticated. Um, yeah, because it, it, maybe that's not a good word, but but what he what he had wanted was was a subtitle that appealed to to somebody who can read at at like an eighth grade level. So so writ might be a word that not everybody's familiar with these days. And so we spent you know um, after we we'd been calling it that for a long time, and we'd actually. We'd we'd released stuff to our marketing department with that title on it and said, okay, don't, you know, just this is just for your own internal knowledge. Don't release this, and they released it. Oh, of course. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure. I think that might have been how John found out about the subtitle. Was it we released it without his approval, not on purpose, but uh, so so John and I and and. Uh, can't remember if there was anybody else. We sat around and spitballed tons of different names that that f- would would fit the game mm-hmm. the way Rid of Fate did, and 
and we nothing stuck. And finally, John said, "You know what? Let's just not have a title on it. Nobody will care." <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> all right, that's fine. No title, but it ended up, you know, everybody still called it uh, the Road of Fate. Yeah, I, don't, I can't imagine somebody say, "Well, I'm not going to buy that game." There's no subtitle. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. <laughs> way to, I, I can see yeah. the point. You know, I just was thinking uh, when I was talking to uh, John the other day. He uh, remember a couple times now that I'm thinking about it. He said something like, "Well, after World of Zine, I was done." You know, the story was done. I mean, was there some? Was, did somebody like pressure him? Was it like, well, we need to have another? That's Might that's interesting here. that he said that. I because I'm just kind of know, paraphrasing I, here. For me, I started I started after World of Zine came out. Yeah. So I, I had nothing to do with New World until post World of Zine. And uh, and that was not the John that I saw. I mean, I to me, John was very very there, very passionate about both Might Magic Six and Might Magic Seven and and. Uh, Heroes two, Heroes three, uh, particularly Heroes three. He spent he spent a lot of time with uh, the designer of Heroes three. Just both of them closed door offices, having meetings about the game. Don't know what they discussed, but but they spent a lot of time on that. So I really think I mean I'd I'd always when I started My Magic nine I was I was really hoping for that same sort of interaction between John and I that that we didn't get and. And that's, I mean, it's, it probably sounds to me like his morale just was was like, you know, 3DO is driving this company into the ground. Um, I'm just going to check out. I don't, I mean, I really don't know, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I didn't feel like he was, he was out after Zine. I thought he was still very much in. It was really something that happened more when Nine was in development. Yeah, when when after after uh, during I, I'd say during the the development of Legends and um, Might Magic Eight was probably the time when he started not being as as uh, passionate about New World and the games we were making. Well, just to wrap up then with the Might and Magic, uh, <laughs> sure, Might Magic uh, Nine. Uh, I read a couple places where you were talking about White Magic uh, 10, Legacy of Grimrock. Mm-hmm. Or wait, that's mm-hmm. not the right title. <laughs> no, <laughs> Legacy. Yeah, I almost did that earlier. I know where yeah. Grimrock came from. Well, that's that was uh, basically everybody called it Legends of Grim, White Magic, what? Legends of Grimlock, okay. because <laughs> that was the game they, they were inspired by. I mean, I played that game. I've reviewed it on this show. And, I you know, I liked it okay. It was fine. Uh I didn't think it was up there with uh, six, you know, by any, yeah. by any means. Uh, and I'm not really sure. I still have a, not really too sure how I feel about it being like Grimrock, grid based sort of movement. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder what what are your thoughts on on that one? Uh, very much the same. I think it it I liked it fine. I thought I thought it was um, as kind of a merger of of uh, the old school kind of step based gameplay and modern graphics. I think I thought it was a little bit clunky. Um, to me, it didn't really feel like a Might and Magic game. There's a certain there's a certain vibe that that I can't put into words. Even though I I was a developer of Might and Magic, there's a certain vibe that Might and Magic games have, and maybe it's the quirky sense of humor that you were talking about earlier that I didn't think Grim Rock really had. And and uh, I think it also goes back to to a little bit what I was saying about air on the side of easy. Not that it was a hard game, but but there's a little corollary to that, which which is uh, something that I always tried when I interviewed game designers or when I was interviewed. I'd always try to put in there about like what's the most important part of of uh, being a game designer. What's the most important part of of developing a game? And and my answer to that, and the answer I'm always looking for is is the controls, is mm-hmm. is how does the player interact with the game? Because if that part fails, if the connection between the player and the game fails, doesn't matter how awesome your game is, your game is going to fail. And a perfect example is is Squeeze Shapes. The the controls yeah. for that game were 
were they were okay. They weren't great. And and I think Grim or uh, Grim Rock, I think My Magic Ten had that same. It it needed some more massaging in in that department. And if if it if it had had that, I think it would have been would have been great. Would have been a great game. Yeah, it's just kind of hard to. Whatever that element is, you know, that's the yeah, yeah, fun the, factor or the, the comfort. I think it might have been a, I don't know if it was you or JVC, somebody said something like these, uh, Might and Magic, these were games that were meant to be played, not looked at. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah I thought that yeah, kind that of sums it John. up there. That, that, that sounds, sounds like John. Yeah. Um, John was very much into, you know, he always told us, and this this is something that, this great advice that I took, I've always taken with me was, when you design a game, design for the minimum requirements, not the maximum requirements. Mm-hmm. And that all the Might and Magic were very much designed that way, so that that if you had a, a slower computer, it still would play well for it, play well on it. And and that was wisdom that definitely came from John. In fact, <laughs> speaking of the the step based gameplay, he we got an email and. And John told us this over over dinner one night. He said, he "said I got a, a letter or an email or something from from a player thanking me for going back to step based gameplay on Might Magic Six. When the truth was that his computer was just so slow <laughs> that, that that was that was oh, how the wow. Game wow. <laughs> and I mean, I think that's probably." some of the greatest advice that I got is there's a lot of games these days are, are the opposite. They want, they want the cutting edge gameplay in some games. I guess that's fine, but, but it's not about playing the game so much as the, the experience. Like, um, as an example, a personal example for me, um, was my experience with gears of war, mm-hmm. which my friend Ken worked on my, uh, some other friends from, from EA worked on, and and uh, the one problem I had very early on in the game was, I mean, it was a beautiful game. Models all look great. Characters are great. Um, the enemies matched the background. Like, maybe the game was too good. They, they're, they're, uh, they went undercover, and they were totally undercover all the time. And then you couldn't, they, they looked, their coloring looked like the cover so much that when they popped out, it was hard for me to tell mm-hmm. what was enemy and what was not and after a while i just i was constantly dying because i couldn't see where to shoot and i'm not a very good console first person shooter guy anyway so i just i ah, forget it forget it and it's it's funny it's that coming to from me, the medal of honor <laughs> yeah it's very funny to me that that two guys two designers who worked on medal of honor worked on that game and and that that game had the problem and i, I don't know if either of them had anything to do with it but one thing we we one problem we had with with uh, Medal of Honor was that uh, you know it, we, it took place in the Pacific Theater with Japanese soldiers and and we modeled the Japanese soldiers exactly the way historically accurate mm-hmm. the the environment was basically historically accurate and it turned out that the the camouflage that they wore worked. <laughs> You, because you couldn't tell which was background and which was the enemy, so they they modified. And I don't remember if they made the, the environment a little desaturated, but that was one bug we had to fix. And then you see the same problem in in that Gears of War. Yeah, so it's that yeah. age old problem, I guess, with strategy or I guess a first person shooter as well. There's a point where it's realism is actually not the way to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's it's. I mean, that's one thing you always got to remember is it's a game. It's supposed yeah. to be, at the end of the day, it's supposed to be fun. All right, Tim, I've kept you for quite a while here. <laughs> I just no, I was happy to do it. I was happy to be here. I don't know if you wanted to do one one more. <laughs> sure, you got time on. for one more. Yeah. Oh, what to choose from. I guess I'll go with this one. This is probably my favorite of these. I was reading all your articles, Tim. And mm-hmm. I'll put some links to these on the show notes, too, because uh, you've done okay. quite a bit of writing. 
Uh, you've done quite a bit of writing about game design and game development, mm-hmm. or like you say, how to get a job in the games industry and all yeah. that. So that's mm-hmm. out there. Uh, but I like this uh, idea of a fun instinct. Uh huh. And at first, I thought you were saying something like, "Well, you either have this instinct or you don't have it." Uh, but it sounds like you're saying this is actually something you can cultivate, right? And, mm-hmm. uh, you can, yeah, you can cultivate your own fun instinct. Uh, can you talk a little bit about more about this concept? I mean, yeah, you know, it's it, there's there's two parts really that that uh, that I think it, it boils down to, and that is being able to think critically about games, and and then being able to to visualize how an idea might play. Um, and the the the, criti- the thinking critically about games is something that that I always always whenever whenever I interviewed somebody as a candidate for for any position as a designer, it's always something that it was the most important question I asked. And even though it seems like a throwaway, I'd ask I'd ask them, "What's your favorite game?" And I didn't care what their answer was. I didn't care if they said Magic Nine. Come on. Yeah, I didn't care if they said Might Match Night. I didn't care if they said Barbie's Horseback Adventure. <laughs> you know, Barbie's they Horseback said, Adventure. Yeah, if they said if they said Barbie's Horseback Adventure is my favorite game of all time, and I'd ask why. And then that's where is I. Like, that was what I was really interested in was if they could put into words what it was about that game that made it fun. And sometimes they could. Sometimes they could say. Well, you know, the, the, the controls for riding the horse were really fun, and I enjoyed the creativity of being able to decorate the horse any way I wanted. I, you know, and if, if they can put it into words, that's, that's somebody who's going to go places. Yeah. They said, I don't know, it was fun. Well, what do you want? I mean, <laughs> well, you're not, you're not my guy. You know, that's and Barbie that's, in it. Come on, Barbie. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that's something that, that, as a designer, being able to, to think about what in a game mechanic what makes a game mechanic fun that's that's something that that i mean it's it's as somebody who plays games all the time and you know i've probably played thousands of games it's something that i just kind of learned from playing a game that's that's good and then playing a game that's not good and and realize we'll say why does this game suck <laughs> you know like we were talking about like i was just talking about the the gears of war well i didn't like that game well why well i can tell you why um, and that's that's one thing that that I mentioned in those articles is is the only one of the only real ways you can do that is to play all sorts of games. Like I used to have a GameFly account, and I'd I'd get all sorts of games. I'd get I'd get you know games that I wanted to play and I'd play for fun. Then I I'd, I'd go through I'd like scroll through the list and say what is the worst rated game on here, and I'd get that game. And then I'd play, and I'd say, "Well, why doesn't this game work? What's wrong with it?" Interesting. And and I think I probably should have been. I almost was a game teacher. I almost taught. I did. I interviewed at at uh, LA Film School a couple of years ago as a as an instructor, and and that's something that I think I probably would have tried to put in the curriculum. Is okay. Here's your game assignment, or just play a game like a book report on a game. Except instead of talking about the you know the story or whatever, you say. Tell me about the game mechanics. What works? What doesn't work? Why doesn't it work? What would you do different? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that the the idea of being able to visualize whether or not a game mechanic is fun or not in your head, which is something I do all the time. I do it when I'm driving. I think about like like the game I'm working on. Like, what's is that going to be fun? And I have to play it in my head. And that only comes from playing just playing games and playing games and and again like thinking critically about the games. That's probably the most important part of of a game designer in general is the controls. Obviously, I went back to that, and then uh, and then thinking critically about it. I guess that's the great conundrum for game designers too, because that's the hardest thing to get across. I mean, you can't look at screenshots or gameplay footage or trailers yeah. and yeah. get that what you're talking about. That sort of does mm-hmm. it feel good when you're playing? Yeah, and that's something that, that as well, when I'm looking for a game that I want to play, I actually, I, I feel like, and maybe I'm completely wrong, but I feel like when I look at a screenshot now, because I've played so many games, like say, that game looks like it'll be fun. And sometimes I'm, most of the time I'm right. Tremendously right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, 
uh, sometimes I have. And then I'll play it. Even sometimes I'll see a screenshot. That game doesn't look like fun. And then I'll play it, like a very highly rated game. Play it. And then, uh, no, I'm right. I, I, I'm not going to like this. Not to say that game. Some of those games that are highly rated are bad games, but not my kind of game. Sometimes. Yeah. All right. I, mean, I just played an oil game recently that struck me that way it's like a little oil Which prospect game? i don't remember the name of it it was like an oil prospecting game oh okay on steam like an oil tycoon or something yeah it was kind of like dig dug where you're digging these little uh oh okay pipes into yeah. the ground to find the oil veins mm -hmm. and yeah it's just like yeah i looked at the screenshots i don't care about oil prospecting you know that's not a theme or setting <laughs> yeah. i don't care about that but i just when i saw the mechanic mm -hmm. i thought that looks like a fun a fun thing to do for a couple hours you know yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, I thought the same thing about um, the Kerberos Space Program. Yeah, it's another another Steam game, and and uh, for me that game got a little too complicated, too fast, yeah. and and I kind of I put it aside. And, uh, well, it was it looked fun because it's I actually think I saw the word physics in the somewhere on the description. And it was, yeah, at that yeah. point it was too hard for me. <laughs> it's well, it's very much uh, a, a, as I was. It was recommended to me by a guy who works at SpaceX. He said, you want to know what it's like launching a, a rocket? Play that game. And I said, wow, launching a rocket's really hard. <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, uh, next week we'll probably be looking at a game review, uh, but it might take a little while, longer than a week actually, because I will be traveling to a wedding, uh, specifically my brother Luke is getting married to his uh, sweetheart Dixie, uh, so uh, please wish them well, uh, keep them in your thoughts. I think they're getting married, uh, I want to say maybe Friday or Saturday, uh, anyway, I'll try to take some pictures if there's any game related stuff and uh, pass those on uh, to you, but anyway, congratulations Luke and or Dixie if you happen to be watching this. Uh, as always, I want to thank you uh, very, very, very much for your support of this show. As you know, this show is entirely funded 100% by dirty rats just like you. <laughs> no, uh, no other funding uh, coming in to keep these episodes going. No ads, uh, nothing to annoy you. I'm just here to delight. <laughs> that is it and all. So if you want to be a part of the team, uh, just uh, go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site or you go to matchat.us. There's a couple of options there, uh, ways to support the show. And I'll actually talk about those uh, more in a minute. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be opening up uh, this box that was sent in to me by In Exile Entertainment, courtesy of Brian Fargo himself. And to tell you the truth, I'm not exactly sure what is in this thing. I got a pretty good idea, but anyway, uh, I'll open up this in a minute. All right, let's see. Before we get to the news as well, I wanted to uh, welcome a couple of new uh, rats to the pack. Uh, we've got, let's see tiny print here. Uh, James Dunn, uh, Darag Wickham, or Derek Wickham, Shadow Minion, <laughs> Alf Zzz. I'm starting to feel like uh, Rowan Atkinson in that, that uh, Schoolmaster skit, if you remember that one. Uh, Amberzine D, and uh, I think that's all. Not sure if I mentioned Michael last time, but just in case I didn't, uh, <laughs> I welcome Michael as well. Okay, and uh, anybody else, you know, sometimes uh, this doesn't work quite right, so if I didn't miss your name, uh, just let me know and I'll be sure to add that. Uh, sometimes it takes me a couple of days to, or a couple of episodes to upgrade, uh, update the credits, uh, but uh, don't worry, I definitely will get around to that uh, soon. All right, so what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, this week I've got uh, three items here. Uh, one is from uh, Stig. He wrote in about this uh, new uh, trilogy, I guess, or three new games, I guess, on, on GOG, goodoldgames.com. Uh, they've got Fallout 3, uh, Fallout New Vegas, and Oblivion up there out right now. They're only 10 bucks each, or thereabouts. Uh, and I'll put a link to the show notes uh, to my GOG account. So if you want to pick these up, just remember, don't go straight to GOG. I use my affiliate link if you don't mind. It won't cost you anything extra, but they'll knock a few dollars my way 
definitely will appreciate that. Uh, and Shane wrote in about this. This is Portalarium. Uh, they're opening the books for equity crowdfunding. So apparently uh, they're running a little short of cash these, these days, so they've gone back to the crowdfunding. Uh, but this time uh, they're doing something they're calling equity crowdfunding. Uh, so in addition to usual sorts of rewards, you actually get a, a stake in the company. Now it's uh, 500 bucks to get in. Now, they don't charge you unless they raise their, their goal of, I think, about a half million dollars. Uh, however, as reading a little bit more into this, apparently there's not very high expectations that you're going to make a lot of money by investing in this. Uh, you may not even make your money back on this. Uh, so if you want to do it, I'll just uh, say it this way. Uh, do it because you love the game, uh, you want to support Lord British. I wouldn't go in with the expectation of uh, making a lot of money with this. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think it's a worthy, a worthy thing, uh, so go check it out. I'll post a link to the show notes to this article if you want to read that first and some, <laughs> some of the fine print uh, they point out there. And then uh, finally, Adam uh, wrote in about Neo Habitat. Uh, this is a relaunch of the first uh, massively multiplayer game, Habitat, from uh, Lucasfilm. Uh, that was, uh, I believe, it originated on the Commodore 64, right? Uh, didn't, it was, did okay, it didn't really do great, but I guess uh, they thought it was worthy of uh, resurrecting this as an open source project being uh, led by Randy Farmer, who actually worked on the original Habitat game. So this might be an interesting thing to, maybe I'll get in touch with Randy at some point, see if I can get him on the show. I'd love to, to learn more about this really early, uh, massively multiplayer online game. Anyway, so thanks to Adam Shane and Stig for those news items. <laughs> Let's get this box open. All right, so I'm pretty sure what's in here is the uh, reliquary, the from the Ultimate Collector's Reliquary Edition uh, of the Bard's Tale uh, for a Kickstarter project, and that was a a $550 campaign. It was only sent to people that supported it for uh, that amount of money. Uh, but Brian, as you know, he's a big supporter of this show, so I think he actually sent me one as a gift. Uh, that's just how cool that <laughs> Brian is. Really, really excited about this. Of course, I want to be very careful with open when I open this thing, so I, I made sure to, to sharpen my axe. So this thing is razor, razor sharp. Should be able to get this thing open, just like they do in the role-playing games, with a minimum amount of damage to the box. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully not even so much as scratch that reliquary. So I'm going to line this up, Let's see if I can get this thing open. My strength is only like 12, though. <laughs> so, so who knows if I'd be able to bash this thing open or not. But anyway, let's give it a go. And I have successfully opened the box. <laughs> <laughs> and if you guys believe that, you'll believe anything. Now, so I was just getting around before. I actually opened this very carefully with my uh, Rambo survival knife. If you remember that. I got this open, and it is the Reliquary. Yes, the, one, the same one from the video. And I got to tell you, this is a absolutely stunning box. Uh, the, the level of detail on this thing is amazing. You got little wolves there. I guess some kind of Celtic uh, Gaelic designs uh, all over it. It's uh, studded with these little uh, sort of brass uh, studs all over. I mean, <laughs> it looks exactly like the sort of thing you'd find uh, playing Bard's Tale. Uh, opening this, you know, there's some nice uh, velvet liner in there. Of course, the, the game and stuff is not in here yet because <laughs> you know, they haven't uh, released that yet. But uh, when, that, when that stuff comes, I'll be uh, able to put that in here have a very nice way to store all of the collectibles uh, from the game. So anyway, absolutely beautiful. Really appreciate this, Brian. Uh, I'm not quite sure if you can still get one of these on, you know, if you didn't support it on the uh, the Kickstarter. Uh, or was it, was it Figure Kickstarter for that one? Anyway, I'm not sure. I'll look into this before I post the video, though, and, and see if there is a way. Because I, I think you would definitely like to have one of these. Uh, I know I'm very proud of mine. So thanks again uh, to Brian. Oh, look at that. Fits beautifully <laughs> right there on the shelf. Wow. <laughs> this sort of thing makes it all worthwhile, right? Uh, anyway, uh, let's uh, move on then to the uh, Ale of the Week. All right, so you might think I've already drank the Ale. <laughs> I'm not having too much fun here. All right, this is the uh, Ale of the Week. This is a 
Jack Pine Brewery, Big Buck Barley Wine Style Ale. 2017, clocked in at 10% alcohol. Uh, so this actually sounds like a very good combination to me. I love the barley wine style. Uh, sometimes they get carried away, I think, put way too much alcohol in it. Uh, I think 10% ought to be just about right. And this is from the Jack Pine Brewery out of Baxter, Minnesota. Well, see, these guys are probably just down the road. That's pretty cool. Let's see. Big Buck is brewed each year to celebrate the brewery's anniversary. Drink fresh to experience the bold nature of this aggressively hopped ale or age it to allow the rich malt complexity to develop. Now, so I guess I could, I could age this in my reliquary, but uh, I'm not really good at aging ale. I tend to want to drink it. Uh, what can I say? <laughs> Store in a cool, dark place. Well, I don't know any cooler or darker place than inside the old stomach. So let's get this thing open and see what it's all about. All right, let's get this thing open. And I have my handy dandy Predator uh, bottle opener. I just love this thing. You know, once you get into this, this stuff, you'll find that there are special everythings. All right, so let's pour some of the, uh, what is this, Big Buck barley wine style ale here and pour it in this glass first get a nice look at the glass and you can see the color there it's nice uh sort of dark coppery color nice a bit ahead on that uh, looks really good pours well you might say all right let's pour the rest into this rather excellent drinking horn i know a lot of you guys have been asking me like when's the new horn coming where the hell is that new horn you've been promising you know, you've been losing sleep over this. You've been freaking out, but just be patient. <laughs> Old uh, crazy Steinar is still working on it. Apparently, uh, he actually wants to do a good job. So he's really taking his time. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to be very excited when that thing does finally arrive. <laughs> Whew, now this one. You know, I'm a little bit stopped, uh, stopped up. I can still smell this very well. A lot of hops. It smells more like an IPA to me than a barley wine. You know, usually with a barley wine, it does kind of smell like a wine or kind of a champagne-like uh, aroma to it. This one, I'm just smelling the hops. But again, take that with a grain of snot because <laughs> I am a little bit congested here. But uh, anyway, let's give it a taste. Oh. Whew. Now that. Good. <laughs> Let me try it again here. Mm, man. You know, this is just a creamy, hoppy, uh, just the right amount of bitterness in there. It's a little bit sweet, actually. Kind of got a sweet aftertaste to this. Uh, kind of a, mainly what I'm tasting is that sort of toasted malt or sort of roasted malt and uh, uh, the hops a little in there. Don't really taste anything that I would uh, call a barley wine flavor, though. Uh, again, I usually associate those with kind of a, a lot more grape flavor, a little more champagne flavor. This uh, tastes more like, a, to me, a, I don't know, sort of a chocolatey porter uh, might taste. But I will say it is quite tasty. Let me try it again here. Man, just exquisite finish on this. Uh, it'd be a little hard to rate it because, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't even be able to tell you this was a barley wine. I'd probably say it was an IPA. If I just tasted it, you know, a really good IPA, but there's not a lot of that sort of barley wine flavor in there. It's the only problem with this. Now, however, uh, with that caveat, if you just want something that tastes really good, uh, this is uh, really hits the spot. Let me give it one more taste here. Yeah, just a really, really good flavor on this. Goes down really smoothly. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do, I guess. You know, if you're looking at this in terms of a barley wine, and I have to go kind of low, uh, maybe as little as a three uh, out of five drinking horns on that, it doesn't really taste like a barley wine to me. Uh, if, on the other hand, you're looking for sort of a, a really rich, really good quality uh, chocolatey IPA, sort of porter, that sort of flavor, uh, I think this would be an excellent choice. So with that caveat, I'll go ahead and give this a five out of five. Uh, but again, though, if you really want something more barley whiny, if you will, you'll probably find something uh, elsewhere. So anyway, we'll go a uh, five out of five with that caveat on the Big Buck Barley Wine Style Ale.
All right, so I was looking for a quotation about responsibility and leadership and uh, all so, something in that sort of vein. And I found this one from uh, Max Dupree, the American businessman. And it sounds kind of eerily relevant to this uh, discussion. Anyway, uh, it goes something like this. The first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. The last is to say thank you. In between, the leader is a servant. So ponder on that and see you guys next week or thereabouts. in a land war in Asia, but only slightly less well-known is this. Never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line. <laughs>